Ashwin Gwandor versus Lydia Gallicano et al. in the week of January the 17th, 1994. Uh, Monday, I did a lot of the uh, editing on Lydia, uh, getting it ready to be telecast. I did the editing at Terrytown uh, with Sonny McLean. And we've had such a wonderful and glorious winter this year, haven't we? Uh, first, we had uh, on this particular day, the 17th of January, Monday, first we had uh, snow, and then we had sleet, uh, and then it all changed to rain again. And uh, well, anyway, let me tell you about the editing. It was uh, we got a, a great deal done. We got fro five programs done, five half-hour programs done on three-quarter inch videotape, and then we made the uh, VHSs. And the cost of the editing was $180. Uh, and uh, what chapters were they? Well, I, I think they were, uh, the last one was 21, so that would be 16, chapters 16, 17, 18, 19, and 21, each one a half an hour. And what dates did they cover? Uh, they covered everything except uh, what happened in the uh, last few months of 1993. But then I want to, uh, we had a terrible time. It was on uh, Wilders uh, Street in Washington and Terrytown, and that uh, goes uh, to the west from uh, Route 9, and it goes right down a steep hill uh, to the Hudson River, which of course once was a bank of the Hudson River because that whole thing was cut by the Hudson River, which was millennia ago. And uh, the hill was glare ice, and the Lincoln was parked going downhill, aim toward downhill. So the trick was to turn the Lincoln around to make a U-turn. And then Lincoln started to slide sideways down the hill toward the Hudson River. So the only hope was to uh, uh, I finally got it into reverse and got it back and so that I could aim the wheels up the hill, at least aim in the right direction. Then the only hope was to let the uh, tires spin until it melted all of the ice and the tires hit the asphalt and could grab. Well, that eventually happened, but it took 200 revolutions. And then it started up the hill and faltering, but it kept going and going little by little. And finally, when we got above Washington Street, the town had sanded and salted, and uh, it was possible to uh, get up to Route 9A and then to turn south and go over 287, <laughs> which was no lark either. Thank heavens that the temperature was a little above 32 then and got rid of the, some of the, the ice and the sleet. OK, let's go back here. And uh, so I think one more chapter will do that. I think we'll be on the final chapter very soon. This is mailing number 48 on January the 17th, 94 week, Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin, 21 Greenridge Avenue, what happened? And this is Torsh's, Wept to Torsh's Act, number 569. On January the 17th, Monday, uh, Glendora reported to Officer Fisher the latest Torsh's acts and harassments. Uh, Franklin was distributing last week's log to the apartments in this complex. Anella Alpucci opened her door and said to Franklin, Quote, get away from my door, you F blank blank K I N G lunatic. F was on his way down the stairs from 4B. She picked up uh, the envelope and threw it at him. That's number 570 and number 571. At 12.50 p.m., Glendora went to her cellar bin. The 200-watt bulb was stolen. This is the third time a bulb has been stolen from outside her bin. Then it... Uh, the value is uh, about $2.80 approximately, and the three-way adapter was missing between the bulb and the uh, ceiling fixture, number 572 and number 573. And the porcelain ceiling fixture was vandalized. There's another one. That's number 574. It is impossible to screw the bulb into the socket. Something has been done to the threads. Glendora came upstairs and reported this to John Porzio, the owner, and then she called Officer Fisher to report it to him. 
he was on the road. 1.30 p.m., Glendora came out of the apartment with a camera recorder to go edit with her backpack of accessories and her editing box full of videotapes. Simultaneously, Roberta opened the door, Roberta Waltz, that is, of her apartment on the second floor. Roberta sounded down to Glendora, quack, quack. It was the same sound as 3.50 p.m. Thursday, January the 13th, so now Glendora knows them. Uh, the ones on Thursday were done by Roberta, so this is number 575. These are the people who wanted to mediate. These have been harassments from all three families. and There have been harassments from all three families in one week, Larkin, Alpucci, and Walsh. One minute later, Roberta closed her apartment door and called in a loud, high voice, Glendora! That's number 576. When Glendora left the front glass door as Franklin pulled up, and Glendora got into the Lincoln. Roberta called from her second floor window, quack, quack. She did two other quacks. It was six quacks in all, number 577 and number 578. The weather was sleet, icy, underfoot, and snow all over the ground, 32 degrees. 32 degrees, we went to Terrytown and edited from 1.40 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, the papers could not be notarized Tuesday and served and submitted on Wilson Wall yesterday because everything was closed at the courthouse tower. It was because of the uh, snowstorm, so today Franklin did it. They are served on Wilson. Wilson is the lawyer for Larkin and uh, Andrew Larkin and Kevin Larkin. 10.30 a.m., Officer Fisher called Glendora. Where were you all afternoon yesterday? I forgot to turn on my telephone answering machine. With all of Roberta's quacks, Glendora was distracted. I even drove by to see you, Officer Fisher said. Glendora said I was in Terrytown editing a chat with Glendora. Okay, he wanted to know about the theft. That would be the theft of the bulb and the light uh, adapter down in the cellar, by the cellar bin. So Glendora told him about that and about Roberta's quacks and taunting. At 4.06 p.m., paginate and file. I paste up the plaintiff's answer to Wilson. Uh, we need the last two pages with signatures and a notary. Uh, one hour on wall yesterday and two and a half hours today. Peter brags that he's a self-made man, and his mother-in-law says, and I said him to take the blame. Uh, this paper was under our door this morning. This paper right here. And that would be Wednesday, uh, January 19th. It does not have a last name and does not have a return address. It could possibly be written by Roberta Walsh. It does not count. It is a put-up job. Franklin reduced the last two pages of Wilson, then he made 22 copies. It cost $7 and took an hour. Uh, 2D man at 6.38 p.m. saw Glendora and lighted East bedroom window and, started and, blew and blasted his horn. He has no control. It's an insane thing to do. Glendora will tell off sufficient tomorrow. That's number 579. He has perpetrated this harassment over 20 times. Glendora put away the masters from the copy, 6.45 p.m., did the wall envelopes, and Frank did all the errands in White Plains Center on foot because the Lincoln is in the hospital having a valve lifter fixed. 7.13 p.m., the envelopes are addressed, stamped, the paper is folded and stuffed, the envelopes are sealed. Glendora's affirmation in opposition to Larkin's so-called answer received uh, two months untimely. And then read the law. So about this, uh, you want to know what uh, what started this? Uh, it was the breaking of the law by the Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin families, the White Plains Noise Ordinance, April the 11th, 1993, Easter, yelling, shouting, hooting, whistling, or singing at any time or place so as to annoy or disturb the peace, quiet, comfort, uh, health, uh, repose uh, of any of persons in any dwelling or other residence. That's the law that they broke. And when Glendora stood up for her rights and began videotaping her evidence, instead of reforming, these hoodlums started a long campaign of retaliation, more law breaking, harassment, vandalism, thievery, abusive and insulting language, horn blowing, fright, mental disturbance, and littering. 
On Thursday, Franklin delivered the Wall, Wilson, Glendora answer to the apartments. The others are to be mailed. Daniel Walsh came down the stairs and Glendora heard him shuffling papers, so she looked out the door to see if this was her papers he was shuffling. No. Yesterday, Glendora put down a new doormat. Uh, let's see how long it will be before it is stolen. Two others have been stolen. Glendora asked Cal Canny to reform Walsh, Al Pucci, and Larkin the way he reformed the Dukes. 9.30 a.m., James Walsh made undue noise coming down the stairs, intent to annoy and disturb with no legitimate purpose, elephantine steps. Wall chapters 20, 21, 22, and 23 are on continental cable vision north of here. 18, 19 have been cable uh, telecast. And 1 p.m., Glendora's doormat was at 1A, and the 1A doormat was at Glendora's door. Who, why? And Franklin is using one typewriter, so that's why. And the other typewriter is missing a typewriter ribbon. Ah, see this? See the signature? Okay, this is from Judge Donovan, Supreme Court of the State of New York. Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, New York. Glendora versus Walsh, and also Glendora versus Hubbard. That would be modern courts. Uh, Glendora, I will consider your request for my recusal. This is Judge Donovan saying, I will consider Glendora's request for Judge Donovan's recusal from your cited actions provided you file a dual captioned and dual index motion covering both cases on proper notice to all defendants, counsel, returnable on a Friday, set the facts upon which you base your claim of the unfairness and bias on the part of this court. One dual caption motion should suffice since undoubtedly your claims will overlap each other in all actions. As at least one motion in each case is now pending before me, such recusal motion must be promptly filed and I will initially delay consideration on the pending motions for a period of 20 days to see if the recusal motion with an understandably later return date has in fact been filed with my part in room 1606. If not, I will proceed to pass on motions now before me. Very truly yours, W. Dennis Donovan, Supreme Court Justice, copy to Bruce Bendish, and a copy to Clifford Gelbam Purvis. That's the lawyers for modern courts. I immediately got the motion ready, the notice of motion, and I'll read it to you as soon as I finish this log. Thursday, it took an hour and a half to do the wall editing today. Chapters 43 and 44 were laid down, music and graphics, VHS archives. They are ready to be telecast. Glendora's Lincoln is shot. The garage where she took it to have the lifters repaired broke a rod and blew a head gasket. The engine is ruined. It was just 44 miles short of making 1,000, 18, no, 188,088 miles, 188,088 miles. Glendora had to rent a car because she does not believe in credit cards. Uh, she had to uh, pay cash and she put down $500 for the car. 300 of it will come back. Uh, Glendora is busy all day with the car. She told Bob, the tenant upstairs, how the engine was ruined. This was at 8.15 while she was waiting for the rental car to be delivered. The man in 2D moved out today. Uh, they had three vehicles. This is today, Saturday. Uh, they had three vehicles blocking the driveway. His, a rider rental truck, and the girlfriend of the woman in 2D. It was 29 degrees. The cats wanted to sit in the south windows at 29 degrees. <laughs> first time since it's been one degree and zero degrees. So the cats wanted to sit in the window, the south window, and so the window was open. The cats were sitting there in the sill. And the second woman's vehicle was blocking their exit, so they just sat there. And then the first woman said, Sss, to Ginny Cat to scare the cat. Then Glendora went to the window, and then the first woman said, she's the one that you've seen on videotape on the September 24th harassment the one with the dog, the cute little dog, Chelsea. And this woman, this woman that I'm talking about said she's going to videotape it. 
Glendora was audiotaping it. The video cameras were put away. The second woman taunted, Are you Glendora? And Glendora had not talked to them before, after or during all this. And the second woman said, Are you Glendora? She says, My father is a lawyer. The first woman made two or three more taunts. Then the first woman made an obscene gesture. They drove away and back again, blocking the driveway and parking the car in the driveway under our south window. Glendora had the video camera on standby. Glendora called the White Plains police and summoned them. They refused to come. The charge was harassment, acts to annoy and disturb with no legitimate purpose. Officer Lick came on and refused to send anybody. Glendora said she wanted to speak to her supervisor. He refused. This was all around noon. Glendora recorded it on audio tape 525 too. Glendora called again to make her request clear. I want an officer to come to 21 Greenridge Avenue, apartment 2A. The complaint is harassment. Again, Lick came on. Again, Glendora said she wanted to talk to a supervisor. A man came on. His badge number was L26. He's a lieutenant, and he would not talk. He said something deliberately unintelligible. It was a pathetic showing. It was a bad performance. It was out and out dereliction of duty. Officer Fisher works 10A to 6P. Monday through Friday. Apparently, Lieutenant Quinn does also. Uh, so when something happens on a weekend, you can't get Officer Fisher. It is depressing. Any fool can break the law in White Plains and know that no policeman will do anything about it. The police are impotent. Sergeant Fitzsimmons says, call the police and get a report made. You do that, and the police fail in their duty. It is a sham. 1.11 p.m., the four people came out of 2D. The second woman drove off her vehicle, blowing the horn. Glendora videotaped it through the closed window. She closed it because Jeannie went out and Katie went to sleep. Then the man in 2D drove off the rider truck, blowing that horn. Then the second man, who was helping with the moving, drove off in his car, the car that belongs to the man in 2D. And so there was a third horn blowing, and they were having their last hurrah. It was all very poor and low level and lacking in intelligence. And so this adds up to Tortious Act 589. But they left and they moved. About an hour later, Officer Crinebill, number 27, called and said he worked with Lieutenant Quinn and asked what had happened. He said he would write a report and it could be picked up Tuesday. Glendora told him how badly the White Plains police had made themselves look. It is too bad. About an hour later, Glendora called and left a message for Lieutenant Quinn that a chat with Glendora would be on the cable TV system up north at 3 p.m. That would be Continental Cable TV, Channel 6, and it was Glendora versus Walsh, El Pucci, and Larkin, which is Lieutenant Quinn's case. For two hours, Glendora Index Label planned the editing and distribution. The wall videotape was telecast at 3 p.m. The time on wall today is two hours. Judge Donovan wrote Glendora and said he would consider recusing. You heard the, uh, you, the letter was just read to you. So uh, the police should come when the people breaking the law are still there. They shouldn't wait until after the people have gone. Sunday, no time for wall. There was peace, the way it should be. Bill, I'm in my cereal stage. I feel my corns more than I feel my oats. Uh, on the Monday, uh, January 24th, Officer Fisher called again. He took the report about 2T and about the Nella Alpucci horn blowing outside the east window at 3.30 p.m. and 5.25 p.m. on Monday. Six times at 3.30 p.m. and three times at 5.25 p.m. That's number a Tortious Act 591. Glendora's new engine came today. It's 351 cubic inches. It's a Windsor. Ed. There's only one thing that kept me from going to college, and Pete says, yeah, what was that? And Ed said, high school. A quarter of an hour today on wall. The wall programs are on TV five times this week, all half hours, all different, all different cable companies, Manhattan, Continental, TCI, Cablevision Harrison, Cablevision Yonkers. January the 25th, 1994, Tuesday, 7.15 a.m., Nella Alpucci blasted her car horn, number 592, the motion for recusal was served and submitted to Judge Donovan. Glendora talked at length to John Porzio. This is the day Officer Fisher called, not yesterday. Correction. 
Glendora's date to interview the New York Giants will be April when spring training starts at Fairleigh Dickinson. The best engine in the world, folks, was taken out of the Lincoln today. The very best engine in the whole world. Glendora videotaped it. You can see it on TV. The brave engine that went 14 years and 188,000 miles. Foiled by a broken rod and a wrist pin. It cost $2,000 for this and $500 for the rental car. Here is a report by Eric Fisher, apartment 2A. Report taken over the phone. Complainant reports between above. Something in the Times. A person or persons unknown stole a 200 watt light bulb and an adapter plug from a basement light fixture at the above location. Complainant reports that this light socket, oh, that this light socket was also damaged. Total value approximately $5.70. Complainant uh, I think, uh, well, it's the same as inform the landlord. Oh, stated that the landlord has already been in notified. Good report, Officer Fisher. Theo Alpucci knocked on Glendora's outside bedroom wall on January the 25th, 1994, Tuesday, with his hockey stick. He came east on the driveway, knocked on the south wall, and then turned north into Building B, number 593 harassment. 450 p.m., uh, excuse me, uh, at 4.50 p.m., while Glendora was visiting the Lincoln in intensive care, a call came on our recorder from Larkin Lawyers, Wilson Bobby, that they wanted to ask a couple of questions. Well, if they call again, Glendora's answer is, put it in writing. Put it in writing. A lawyer is the last person in the world you can trust, so you have it in writing. 9 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., a chat with Glendora was on Channel 8 TCI, 21 towns in Westchester. 21 Greenridge Avenue, Chapter 38, Wall, December 1993. Glendora fasted for four days strictly and never lost a pound. It's unbelievable. Still at 140 pounds every single day. How can you eat less than nothing? It's not fair. A self-important businessman had some clients come for a meeting, and he said to his secretary, while I'm in this meeting, I want you to call my broker. And the secretary said, yes, sir. Would that be stock or pawn? 11.20 p.m., get the log ready to go to the printers, then do the, the envelopes. Wilson sent another copy of their screwball paper after Glendora has already answered it and after Glendora has already got the return receipt requested back, and the blue back was bleached out with Clorox. That's law office pandemonium. Here is Officer uh, Krein Beal's report. Okay, headquarters received a call from Mrs. stating she was being harassed. I made the phone contact uh, in regards to her complaint. She said that a woman who stays at apartment 2D walked by the window and scared her cat. She does not know this woman's name. She then stated that a friend of the woman also walked by and was verbally taunting her. I advised her I would something to police officer Fisher. Well, this officer gets uh, Officer Kreinbeil, spelled K-R-E-I-N-B-I-H-L, gets a C for this report. He left out the obscene gesture. When we went to church Sunday morning, there was a cruiser passed us on Grandview in Hartsdale. The officer was handsome, red hair, blue eyes, and ruddy red cheeks. Who is he? Here is the return receipt requested from the Larkin lawyers, Wilson, Bobby, Comboy, and Bobby. Okay, that's what happened on Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin on uh, January 17th week. Now I will read you the motion to Judge Donovan to recuse himself. 
See, this is what he means by a double caption. I hope that's what he means. Dual caption, rather. See, it's the two cases. It's Glendora versus Walt Pucci and Larkin, and it's Glendora versus Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, and modern courts. And that's what he means by the two index numbers. And here's the notice of motion. Please take notice that the plaintiff will move this court at the courthouse, 111 Grove Street, White Plains, New York, 10601, on the fourth day of February, 1994, at 9.30 a.m. of that day, or as soon thereafter, as plaintiff can be heard for an order of recusal. Dated White Plains, New York, January 25th, 1994. Yours truly, Glendora. Box 416, White Plains, New York, 10602-914-949-9495. To all persons listed on page 2. Well, that would be all of the defendants and all of the lawyers. Okay, motion for order of recusal affidavit. Judge W. Dennis Donovan, Glendora being duly sworn to pose and says her reasons for moving for an order of recusal by Judge W. Dennis Donovan follow. In the Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin case, defendant Andrew Larkin is a Harrison police officer. Kevin Larkin is the son of a Harrison police officer. You live in Harrison. Your father was chief of police in Harrison at the same time you were town justice for Harrison. Glendora does not trust your judgment. She feels you made a very bad decision on her case against Lydia Roselli Gallicano on punitive charges for defendants causing plaintiff to pay for defendant's con ed charges when defendant had already been punished by con ed for the same. Glendora has denounced you over several pages of her appellant's brief to the appellant division and sent you a copy of same. In approximately a year and a half, Glendora will go before the appellate division in Brooklyn or in White Plains and orally argue against your bad decision. As for modern courts, you refuse to allow Glendora to monitor your court approximately 10 times. Your law clerk, like the majority of law clerks in Westchester Supreme and County Court, was abusive to Glendora over the telephone, of which I made a written record and sent to you. Glendora has this on audio tape and will telecast it. Glendora instantly protested his pushing her around. He hung up and has been hostile ever since. There is no way, there is no way Glendora can get a fair and unbiased hearing, as the Constitution of the United States guarantees her. And you took an oath to support both the federal and the state constitutions. Glendora, for one, for one, will not be shoved around by arrogant and autocratic law clerks, nor by such court clerks and judges' secretaries. She will fight for her rights to the bitter end and stand up for the same on TV. Like you, she is Irish. Even though law clerks in the Westchester Courthouse Tower make the decisions and the judges have no say, they just sign their names and fill in the dates, Glendora will not be dominated by them. The Walsh Alpucci Larkin record is seen every Wednesday, 8.30 to 9 p.m., Channel 45 on Cablevision in your hometown of Harrison. Glendora does not see why you make such a big job out of recusal. Judge Rosado was asked to recuse himself before you on both of these actions. All it took was a telephone call to his chambers. Immediately he wrote a, an order of recusal, and the matter was finished. Both are enclosed as exhibits. Please, let's get on with these cases before these defendants skip town. Dated White Plains, New York, January the 25th, 1994. Yours in truth, Glendora. Box 416, White Plains, New York. And it, this is what they call the Jurat. Jurat, J-U-R-A-T. And it's uh, notarized by uh, Francis Harrison. And here's the affidavit of service of same upon just the way Judge Donovan wanted it upon the defendants and their lawyers. Uh, the exhibits are just what I've read you before. Uh, what I said about his being in Harris and how I asked him twice to do it. And here's Judge Rosado's recusal. And here's Judge Rosado's recusal from uh, uh, the Modern Courts case. And here is the letter that Glendora wrote to Judge Donovan about Mr. Santucci, the law clerk. All righty. So 
I gotta find a joke at least to tell you. The woman said, yeah, Marilyn says, I just turned 36. Her mother-in-law says, that's right. Yesterday she was 63. And uh, Ed says, I have young blood. And his pal says, yeah, but it's in an old container. And then uh, Betsy says that she was named after Betsy Ross. And her mother-in-law says, not too long after either. Uh, this is what happened on Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Lark in the week of January the 17th, 1994. You stand up for your rights and keep your courage flaming. January the 17th, 1994, and this is what happened with Glendora versus Russell Brower. Uh, I read him some of those uh, rules that I read to you over the phone about how a judgment is collected. And because uh, I thought it was, uh, I should think it would be helpful for him to know how it goes and try to keep himself out of trouble. Uh, well, uh, then he called back and left a message on my recorder that was quite threatening. You remember these that I read to you? And uh, then the next day, I left a message on his recorder adding up all the fees. You know, if he would had paid the uh, amount that the court had awarded, which is $250 plus $5.58 uh, in court costs, uh, that's, that's all he would have had to pay. The court neglected to add on the $2.58 that I ate 16, it would be all together, that we had to pay for a second service because the first address that Russell Brower gave us at 16 King Street was no good. And it had to go over to 32 Kenneth Avenue in Hartsdale. Uh, so the court really should have made it 816, 258, 816. So then I added on all the fees for him, and that by the time you get through, he's going to have to pay now $288, and maybe more. And so the transcript of judgment came in. Have you ever seen a transcript of judgment? Uh, you send $5 to court, and then they give you this transcript of judgment, which looks like this. And it says, State of New York, City Court of Yonkers, County of Westchester, Transcript of Judgment, Small Claims, Glendora, Plaintiff, Doing Business as Glendora TV Ads, First Paper Filed, October 1, 93, Defendant Russell Brower, uh, Amount Sued for $500, Date of Disposition, December 22, 1993, uh, known address was 16 King Street. That's too bad, Port Chester, because it's 32 Kenneth Avenue, uh, Hartsdale, because this address is no good. And the address of the judgment creditor, the post office box 532, Scarsdale, New York, 10583, $250. The creditor was awarded plus $5.58 uh, court fee with a total cost of $255.88. Judgment rendered on January the 4th, 1994, 4.45 p.m. Judgment docketed January 4th, same hour, and it's Cariello. Okay. State of New York, County of Westchester. I, Anna M. Cariello, clerk of the court named above. Hereby certify that the above is a correct transcript from the docket of judgment in my office. Now, the rest is satisfaction of judgment. That's after he pays it. So you take this to the county clerk, okay? The county clerk files it, and that's $10. Then you ask the county clerk for a judgment. First of all, let me tell you what the uh, court sends you. They send you this paper that says what? When you receive the transcript of judgment in the mail, it must be filed in the county clerk's office, 111 Grove Street, White Plains, New York, for further information for procedure, 
call their number and they give it to you and ask for the judgment clerk. That's Francis Harrison. When filing the transcript of judgment with the county clerk, ask for an execution of judgment to be issued to the sheriff of the county. If there is any question concerning the transcript of judgment, please do not hesitate to call the city court of Yonkers at the above listed phone number. I'd better call them and have them change that address. It's the wrong address. See, because look, let me show you the judgment. See, the judgment has the right address. Russell Brower, 32 Kenneth Avenue, Hartsdale, New York, 10530. So I, thought I was going to show you the execution. You go from one office, one clerk to another, and you leave a check at every one of them. Let's find the execution. This is an execution. See, it says execution. Okay. It says Glendora, et cetera, against Russell Brower, 32 Kenneth Avenue, et cetera. Execution with notice to garnish she, the people of the state of New York, to the sheriff of any county, greeting. Whereas in an action in the Justice Court of the city of Yonkers County of Westchester between Glendora, DBA, Glendora, TV ads, Russell Brower, Glendora's plaintiff and Russell Brower's defendant, who are all the parties named in said action, a judgment was entered on January 4, 1994, in favor of Glendora and against Russell Brower, judgment debtor, in the amount of $255.58, including costs of which $255.58 with, together with the I don't know. Interest thereon from uh, January the 4th, 94. That means if he doesn't pay, his interest starts running, in other words, on January the 4th, 94. Whereas a transcript of the judgment was filed on January 24th, 1994, with the clerk of the county of Westchester, in which county the judgment was entered. And whereas a transcript of the judgment was docketed in the office of the clerk of your county, now therefore we command you to satisfy the said judgment out of the real and personal property of the above named judgment debtor and the debts due him, and that only the property in which said judgment debtor, who is not deceased, has an interest or the debt. Let's return this execution to the clerk of the above caption court within 60 days after issuance, unless service of this execution is made within that time. Okay, let's go on. So you take this down to the clerk. This costs $5. And here's the new clerk's name. Leonard Spano instead of Andrew Spano. So you take this down to the second floor of 111 Grove Street or 110 Grove Street across the street. You can either go in the low-rise building or you can go in the court tower. And then you make out another check, and that's for $10.92. And that you give to the sheriff. And that's called a filing fee. Then I think the sheriff asks, adds on poundage fees. So this is going to be up to about $300. Well, so I called the sheriff today, and today is January 26, uh, 94, Wednesday. And uh, because Richard Johnson told me that the sheriff assigned to Hartsdale, the deputy sheriff assigned to Hartsdale would probably go over there the next day. And he did. He went over there, and nobody was there. And nobody answered. But that's all right. He served it. You can serve it by leaving it on the door, or you can serve it by sending uh, it in the mail. And it, he said he made a strong demand. Uh, either you pay or we seize your property. Okay. Oh, now I have to insert in here, along sometime this week, uh, Russell Brower left a message on our phone that he had appealed. Well, we'll have to wait to see if that's true, because certainly I have to be the first one to know. I have to have a copy of that notice of appeal. No such copy has arrived. 
Uh, I don't know whether his 30 days to appeal has expired. Uh, also, you have to bear in mind if he has appeal, and this may be, uh, you know, not even applicable because he may not have appealed. He may just have said he appealed. Uh, that he has to buy the minutes. The appellate term will not consider his case unless they have the written transcript. I'll say the transcript of the trial, the minutes of the trial. And I would figure a trial like that that lasted a half an hour, I would feel the minutes would be up anywhere. I think they'd be up around a couple hundred dollars. So that's what happened on Glendora versus uh, Russell Brower on the week of uh, January the uh, 17th, 1994. And uh, we're talking about his hometown. He says that our hometown has the lowest death rate of any uh, community in the United States. That's because nobody wants to be caught dead there. And they got a second fire truck, so they keep the old one, and they use that to answer false alarms. And he says his town is so small that the Masons and the Knights of Columbus formed a coalition, and they call themselves the Masonites. You take care. Now, what happened in the week of January the 17th on the following? This is the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Glendora versus Glendora Plaintiff versus uh, Cablevision Systems Corporation, Charles F. Dolan, William J. Bell, Mark A. Lusgarten, Francis F. Randolph Jr., John Tata, James A. Kofal. Joseph Osnara, Thomas Garger, and William Quinn, defendants. The case number is 93 Civil, 8344 CLB. Plaintiff Glendora's affidavit in vehement opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss her complaint and plaintiff's repeated motion for default judgment for defendant's failure to answer. Affidavit to the Honorable Charles L. Bryant, Jr. Charles Bryant spells his name has three vowels all in a row. Is that what you call a diphthong? I-E-A, so he's got to be pretty special. Point A, this is a court. It is run like a court. Complaints, answers, motions, cross motions, and not letters. In defendant's failure to answer, the defendant's uh, failure to live by the law of this land. In defendant's haste and in Laurie Callagy's sloppiness, said Laurie gets off a letter to Judge Bryant because they didn't answer when they should have. And all this sloppiness, uh, uh, Callagy turns out to be the lawyer for Cablevision, and Callagy is the lawyer for Gannett for the uh, suit that I brought against Gannett for antitrust. That's in the federal court. Callagy is the lawyer for the suit that I brought against Gannett for libel for the article that they wrote about Judge Johnson's decision from the Harrison Court. It's gone on for three years, and you know the whole thing. Everything's been read to you. Point B, defendants defaulted. Defendant's answer was due in plaintiff's hands January 3rd, 1994. This is default. Defendants failed to answer the summons with notice and complaint. Point C, plaintiff will not accept the return date of February 18th, 1994. The return date for plaintiff's motion for default judgment is January the 24th, 1994. And that was Monday and today is Thursday. Defendant's motion has to have the same return date of January the 24th, 1994. The plaintiff will not accept defendant's motion return date of February the 18th, 1994. This late motion by defendants received by plaintiff January the 21st, 1994 should have been in plaintiff's hands January the 3rd, 1994. This motion by defendants in this letter should be stricken from the record. It does not count. Uh, i show you what came in. This is a... Uh, Uh, Callagy's letter 
And that's dated January 18th, but it wasn't received by me until January 21st, Friday. Uh, this is Callaghy's uh, Cable Vision's Notice of Motion. And uh, this is uh, the affidavit, Callaghy's affidavit, uh, for that motion. And then this is the memorandum of law, so called, uh, in support of the motion. Now, what's the motion about? The motion is about to dismiss, to dismiss my complaint of violation of my right to freedom of speech. Cablevision violated my right to freedom of speech, First Amendment, by taking the program off the cable in Nassau County. That's what this suit is all about. Now, point D, Glendora says, there is nothing wrong with the service. Defendant's attorney is wrong. Uh, Callagy writes, this is his letter, none of the defendants in this action has been properly served. Plaintiff attempted to serve the defendants using that method of service contemplated in form of federal rule, form of federal rule of civil procedure 4C2CII, utilizing form 18A. A notice and acknowledgement of receipt of summons and complaint. You remember that form? I showed it to you. I sent it to each uh, defendant. However, and each defendant ignored it. Not one defendant acknowledged that they had received it and sent it back to me, which the law said they should do. However, this attempt was ineffective for a number of reasons. Callagy writes, first, the method of service utilized by plaintiff no longer existed when she attempted to serve defendants on December 6, 1993. The new federal rules of civil procedure, which deleted this method of service, took effect on December 1, 1993. Second, even if that rule had still been in effect, plaintiff failed to fully comply with its required provisions. Now, Glendora says, defendants show no proof that plaintiff's service was wrong. They do not cite the reference to which they vaguely refer. Plaintiffs followed the rules of service precisely. Every defendant received the summons with notice and complaint as the return receipts show. Every defendant chose to break the law. Every defendant has to pay. Glendora uh, followed exactly what the pro se clerk said about Form 18A, the acknowledgment form. I have received this on such and such a day. And Callagy is being deceitful as usual. Look at what he himself wrote about the necessity of Form 18A in October of 1993. You remember this? Callagy says none of the defendants in this action has been properly served. Now he's talking now about the Gannett case. This was the Gannett case. The complaint was sent by certified mail to three of the defendants without the required acknowledgement of service required by federal rules of civil procedure, 4C2CII. The remaining defendants were not served at all. Nevertheless, we answered on behalf of all defendants and intend to move to dismiss the complainant in his tarry. Now, remember, he's talking about this other case, the Gannett case. But I'm showing you that in the case of the Gannett, he said the reason the service was not proper is because Glendora didn't use for, uh, Form 14A. And in this case, he's saying that the reason the service is not proper is because Glendora did use Form 1418A. In the event that the court has any question as to the timeliness of defendant's answer, now we're talking about the Gannett case, defendants state that in light of the deficiencies in service, no answer was required. Moreover, had plaintiff pro se properly served the complaint by mail with an acknowledgement of service, see, in, this, in the Gannett case, he's saying it should be dismissed because there wasn't a Form 18A. Uh, defendants would have had 20 days within which to return the acknowledgement and then 20 days after such to return the complaint, uh, to answer the complaint. Thus, defendants would have had until August 30th to return the acknowledgement. And Glendora Pro Se says about this, realizing what a fool he had made of himself, whimpering about the service, Callagy finally broke down and he wrote this. Now, this is the Gannett case. Uh, While the method of service upon the corporate defendant and its employees did not comply with Federal Rules of Civil Procedure Rule 4, that's the rules of service, for purposes of this motion, defendants do not contest the sufficiency of service. These lawyers sell their souls. They're all like Dr. Faustus. Point E, Glendora says motions are not made by letters. And I'll read you that part of the letter that, now we're back to the Cablevision case, and Callagy wrote this letter to Judge Bryant. 
and this is the paragraph I want to talk to you about. Notwithstanding her failure to properly serve the defendants, plaintiff has moved for a default judgment returnable January 24, 1994. That was three days ago, Monday. Defendants respectfully submit that in light of the deficiencies in service, no formal response was or is required, and that under the circumstances, plaintiff's motion should be denied. On behalf of defendants, we will shortly file a motion to dismiss the action under Rule 12b-6. I'll tell you about Rule 12b-6. Uh, that's uh, not sufficient grounds upon which uh, uh, relief can be granted. I'll tell you about that. It's just a form. It's nothing but a form. It's nothing to being a lawyer. All you have to do is go to a, a law book, look up a form, and fill in the blanks. Uh, about this, what he just said, Glendora says, there are no deficiencies in service. The service is perfect. The deficiencies lie in defendants attempt to break the law of the land. They're fugitives of service, really, is what they are. Plaintiff moves to strike defendant's letter. Plaintiff received January 21st, 1994. Now, I didn't get that letter until Friday. Uh, along with the defendant's motion, plaintiff received January 21st, 1994. So immediately we went to work to answer this letter, to answer this uh, notice of motion and motion, and to answer the memorandum. And we had to do that uh, Saturday and Sunday to get it into the court on the return date, Monday, the January the 24th, and that took 18 hours. Uh, point F, Glendora says, when the defendants whimper about the service, it is a sure sign defendants have no defense. When defendants and their lawyer whimper about service and do not state the truth about service, it is a sure sign they have no defense. These defendants have no defense. This is why they did not answer timely on January the 3rd, 1994. Now we're talking about Cablevision, the gravamen of this case is that Cablevision took a chat with Glendora off the cable in Nassau County uh, because certain, I believe, judges and politicians couldn't take the heat of having the truth reported every week of their record of what they had done. I believe that these judges and these politicians in Nassau County brought pressure upon Cablevision systems and Cablevision systems took the program off the cable. Uh, Glendora says defendants are too late. They had their time. They should have had their answer to the summons in by January the 3rd, 1994. Point G. There's no declaration by Attorney Callagy. Defendant's attorney does not declare that he is fully familiar with the facts and circumstances of Glendora's case. An instance of this is that the attorney Callagy Callagy does not know the difference between cable casting and broadcasting. This is what Callagy writes. We represent the defendants in this action against the cable broadcasting company, oh boy, and several of its employees for alleged violation of the plaintiff's civil rights. Plaintiff appears pro se. About that, Glendora says, cable TV companies do not broadcast. Only broadcast TV companies broadcast. Cable vision system, cable casts. Cable vision system, their signal goes through a cable. Their signal does not go through the air. That is broadcasting. Only broadcast companies send a signal to the TV set through the air. This is about as intelligent as anything this lawyer Callagy writes in his unacceptable letter, notice of motion, affidavit, and memorandum of law. But then Mr. Callagy, Callagy also works for Gannett. And to this day, Gannett cannot understand the difference between cablecast and broadcast. It's in the paper almost daily. They get it mixed up. There is no declaration by Attorney Callagy, Glendora writes, that he swears he is telling the truth. Ergo, plaintiff does not believe anything he has written, nor should the court. Point H. Uh, Callagy writes, I submit this affidavit in support of the defendant's motion to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint for failure to state a cause of action. The cause of action is the First Amendment, freedom of speech, cable's vi uh, cable vision's violation thereof. And defendants and their lawyer cannot lie about this. This is what cable vision did. It was about the dumbest thing you can imagine. How could a company do anything that dumb? Point I. The court already has one, Glendora says, and that's in response to Callagy's. This action was commenced on December 6, 1993 by filing of the complaint with the court. A copy of the summons and complaint is annexed here too, 
as Exhibit A. Why does he have to send a copy of the complaint to the court? And why does the complaint, why does the court have to pay real estate taxes and real estate rent to store this complaint when the court already has it? And why do you, the taxpayers, have to pay for this real estate cost? Point J, defendants acknowledge the service by return receipt requested. All right. Uh, with, uh, well, all right, let me read what Callagy's complaining about. As more fully described in defendant's letter to the court dated January 18, 1994, a copy of which is annexed here to his Exhibit B, plaintiff has failed to properly serve the defendants. A copy of the form Callagy says she served on December 6, 1993, annexed here to as Exhibit B, shows that plaintiff attempted service by the notice and acknowledgement method, which, that's Form 18A, uh, method which became ineffective on December 1st, 1993. About okay, defendants and attorney Callagy are trying to prejudice Judge Bryant by other judges' decisions. Now, what Callagy tries to do, he talks about the decision of Judge Johnston, uh, Glendora versus uh, Mitchell Broder and Gannett and uh, Curley and all those people and Sherlock and uh, uh, on the breach of contract case that Gannett breached a contract. There is no doubt what they did. But Judge uh, Johnson ruled that they did not. And my belief is that Judge Johnson is afraid of Gannett. He doesn't dare rule against Gannett. And then uh, Gannett had an article in the newspaper uh, about Judge Johnson's decision. As usual, Gannett did not print the other side. As usual, Gannett lied and said that Glendora could not be reached for comment when she could. Uh, and it was not a fair report of a judicial proceeding. And on that basis, I sued Gannett for libel. And that went before Judge Burroughs. And Judge Burroughs' law clerk uh, ruled that it wasn't libel. And again, it's a case of the judges in Westchester County are afraid of Gannett. They have to have that political endorsement uh, when it comes time to vote. So they're, fa they're afraid of the only newspaper in town. Uh, now, just an aside here, that case finally, after a year and a half, I appealed it before the appellate division of the second department. I go down finally on February the 3rd, which is next week, I go in person to Brooklyn, and I stand up for my oral argument, uh, telling that Judge Burroughs' decision was wrong and was bad. All right, now you know what cases he's talking about. So Callagy should never have brought these cases before Judge Bryant. He's trying to prejudice Judge Bryant on the, and trying to get Judge Bryant to rule like all the other judges. And judges do that, believe me. It's easy for them to get into a rut. Uh, so, but Judge Fox, uh, the magistrate judge, who was considering my lawsuit against Gannett for antitrust says, as best as I can determine, these lawsuits are not relevant to this case, meaning the antitrust case, except that without knowledge of them as a context, some of the allegations of the complaint uh, seem unrelated. Plaintiff's other litigation has had no bearing on my recommendation. Now, regardless of Callagy having read uh, this statement by Judge Fox, he goes on and he tries to confuse Judge Bryant. So I say that all of these references to all of the cases that I just told you about should be stricken from the record. Now, I want, uh, Callagy says that the plaintiff, this is in the Glendora versus Gannett for antitrust, plaintiff then, again unsuccessfully, brought antitrust charges against the newspaper company. Well, this is what I have to say about, again, unsuccessfully, quote, unquote. That's an obnoxious, Gannett, monopolistic arrogance. This lawsuit has a long way to go before Gannett Callagy can abrasively say, again, unsuccessfully, quote, unquote. It has to go to Judge Broderick, then it may go to the Court of Appeals before three judges, and then it may go to the Supreme Court before nine judges. Point M, 
Judge Johnson made the bad decision because he was intimidated by Gannett. Judge Johnson made a bad decision because he was intimidated, like all Westchester County judges I know, by Gannett. Judge, it's not only the judges, of course, it's the political bosses. The political bosses don't dare uh, agitate or alienate Gannett. Judges need that newspaper endorsement at election time, and their political bosses cannot get along without it either. Plaintiff objects to the time and space. Defendants try to steal with this irrelevance about these other lawsuits. Defendants should be ashamed by such a child's ploy to distract the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, from thinking about the issues. Gannett's monopoly, antitrust, and violations of the Sherman and Clayton Acts. If defendants had not monopolized, committed antitrust, and violated the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, Judge Johnson may have ruled justly, and Gannett would not have had the crippling power to breach a contract, to lie, to steal, to cheat, and all in their unbearable monopolistic arrogance. The defendants did not even show up for the trial. Glendora appealed Judge Johnson's bad decision. Glendora writes point N. Judge Burroughs was also intimidated by the only newspaper in town. And finally, after one year and a half, as I told you, Glendora gets her chance for oral argument before the five judges of the Appellate Division, Second Department. Actually, only four sit at the bench. The fifth one is called in in case there's a tie. I have been calendared. Now, point O, Glendora says, this is the same type of irrelevant, inapplicable, incoherent, poor practice as the same lawyer did in the Gannett antitrust case in another instance. Let me read that one to you. This one I call bizarre. Please take further notice, Callagy writes, first went to 3C22 of the Civil Rules of the United States District Courts for the Southern and Eastern Districts. If any uh, are to be served, any answering papers are to be served, so as to be received at least seven days prior to the return date of this motion. And uh, and Glendora didn't even get the papers until two days before the return date. So how can you answer seven days prior to the return date if you don't get the papers until two days before the return date? We go on to another point here. Did lawyer Callagy salute the, uh, solicit the uh, Cablevision business? Uh, Glendora wants to know if Mr. Callagy heard about her Cablevision case through the computer in the United States District Court, White Plains, or read about it in the press, and then solicited Cablevision as a specialist in Glendora actions. I, Callagy, am a specialist in lawsuits that Glendora brings. If so, he owes Glendora 15% for the business. Cablevision has tons of lawyers. I don't see why they are not handling this case. Point O, Q rather. The gravamen of this lawsuit is violation of plaintiff's right to freedom of speech, not plaintiff's other lawsuits. The complaint, Callagy writes in the instant action, purports to allege that the defendants have abridged plaintiff's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights in violation of the Federal Civil Rights Statute. Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983, by discontinuing the cable cast of our access television show. Cablevision Systems Corporation, Glendora writes, pressured by their old boy friends, judges and politicians in Nassau County, could not stand the heat of having their record exposed every week at 9 p.m. on Channel 24 throughout Nassau County. That's at 10 p.m., excuse me. The truth was too much for these judges and politicians, and they coerced Cablevision to capitulate, and Cablevision violated a citizen's constitutional right to free speech. This is what happened. It does no good to hire a lawyer and pay him to lie about it. This is what happened. What Cablevision did is wrong. This is incontrovertible. Nobody can violate freedom of speech. Glendora's complaint tells it as it happened. Point R. Glendora says that the defendant's lawyer are lying when the defendant's lawyer write. The company memorandum of law will establish that as a matter of law, plaintiff's complaint fails to state a claim for violation of Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983, for one of the, quote, state action, unquote, necessary to support such a claim. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. Glendora says, plaintiff states her claim. 
violation of freedom of speech. It cannot be denied. Point S, Glendora writes, plaintiff objects. Callagy says, plaintiff's federal claims constitute her sole grounds for federal court just jurisdiction. Should they be dismissed, the court in its discretion may and shouldn't dismiss her supplemental state law claim as well. Defendant's lawyer, Glendora says, have no grounds for this. Point T, Glendora says, defendants and their lawyer keep repeating the same thing over and over and it is a lie. Callagy writes, accordingly, because the complaint fails to state a cause of action as a matter of law, it should, not, should be dismissed in its entirety. Glendora says, the plaintiff's cause of action is violation of freedom of speech. Defendants did it. Defendants have to face the consequences. Point U, Glendora says, the plaintiff opposes summary judgment. Uh, Callagy writes, in the alternative, the court has the power to convert this motion to a motion for summary judgment pursuant to Rule 12b-6 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Glendora says if the defendants wanted summary judgment, they could have asked for the same in their motion to dismiss. Glendora says the defendants give no case for summary judgment. Point V, Glendora writes, plaintiff objects to this attempt to prejudice Judge Bryant. And this is what I refer to. Callagy writes, during the half hour show, plaintiff reads the legal papers, court documents, and other chronicles relating to the numerous lawsuits she has previously initiated against media defendants. Well, what are the, what are the media defendants? Gannett and Cablevision. And why? Because Glendora is in the media. 42 years in broadcast television and 20 years in cable television. That's all she does. Glendora says, this is not a memorandum of law, it is propaganda. Point W, Glendora makes, violation of the First Amendment can't be dodged. Now, Callagy writes, despite Cablevision's decision to discontinue cable casting plaintiff's show, plaintiff has no shortage of opportunities to express her views on the airwaves. Wrong. It's not airwaves. It's on the cable, coaxial cable. All right, let's continue. Has no shortage of opportunities to express her views on the cable. Her show is carried by various cable companies throughout the New York City. And Glendora says her point on this, how does this relieve cable vision of violating the First Amendment. Point X, repetition and padding. Callagy writes, in response to Cablevision's decision to discontinue cable casting her show on a system plaintiff initiated this class action suit against Cablevision and various of its employees seeking $31 million in damages. Class action is that I included every cable, television, public access producer in the United States. Our rights should not be violated. Our rights to freedom of speech, of all things, on public access. Callagy continues, she purports to allege violations of her constitutional rights and various claims of, quote, emotional disturbance, unquote, and damage to her reputation. Plaintiff has yet to properly serve the defendants. In short, plaintiff attempted service by the new and valid method of notice and acknowledgement contemplated, uh, contemplated by former Rule 4C2C2, which he quoted as a defense, remember? Okay, Glendora says to this, defendants have said all this before. Plaintiff has vehemently opposed the whimpers about service. Callagy writes in a footnote, defendants also rely on the Rule 12b-5 defense of insufficiency of service of process as a ground for dismissal. Glendora says, more repetition, more repetition. Point Y, infringement on reporting public information. The complaint fails to state a claim against Cablevision or its employees under 42 United States Code, Title 42 United States Code, Section 1983, the same one he's quoted all along, because Cablevision was not acting under color of state law when it discontinued plaintiff's television program. 
Glendora says defendant's point I has no avail uh, point one. Excuse me. Defendant says that uh, that defendant's point one has no validity. Glendora's federal constitutional right of freedom of speech to report what happened with Scott Lord, the judges, the politicians, the court personnel, and to read the pr uh, public record to inform the public and to stimulate public debate debate was violated. And that's what public access is all about, to inform the public and to inform, uh, to stimulate public debate. The public has to know these things. This is a free and open society. The public votes. The public has to be informed. She was censored when the truth got too hot for the Nassau County public officers involved and some pressured cable vision into violating the United States Constitution. Defendants have to pay. They cannot lie their way out of it. Point Z. Plaintiff's rights, this is Glendora, to freedom of speech are protected by the United States Constitution. And Collegy is saying constitutional, constitutional rights she claims have been violated are only protected against infringement by the government or by those acting under color of state law, as the United States Supreme Court has explained. Glendora says the government did not violate the First Amendment. Cablevision did. Defendants lie and obfuscate. It is not the states, it is Cablevision. Justice defendants try to camouflage their violation of the United States Constitution's First Amendment with extraneous lawsuits, so they try to camouflage their actions with government action and the states. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> it's about uh, 6.16 a.m. Uh, the record is clear what Cablevision did. They censored. The reason they gave Glendora for blacking out a chat with Glendora had no substance. They obviously were puppets in the hands of the judges and politicians who could not take the heat of having the truth about them exposed. The persons who deprived Glendora of her federal right to free speech were Cablevision Systems Corporation. Now, Callagy keeps referring to Cablevision as if they were the only defendant. No, Cablevision Systems Corporation is one defendant. Charles F. Dolan, William J. Bell, Mark A. Luskarten, Francis F. Randolph, Jr., John Tata, James A. Colfall, Joseph Asnara, Thomas Garger, and William Quinn. They are the persons, not a corporate entity, that violated the First Amendment. We've gone through points A to Z now. We have to start with point double A. Glendora says, wait a minute. Callagy says, essentially, plaintiff's complaint is that Cablevision, a private entity, canceled her television show in what she considers to be a negligent manner. Glendora says, plaintiff's complaint is that the television show was canceled by the persons listed below. And I list the caption. And it's these persons that I just read to you. Not by Cablevision, a uh, private entity, but by these people and by these people. Glendora says, all of a sudden, defendant's lawyer misrepresent the caption. This lawyer should be sanctioned for lying to the court. Point double B, abridgment of First Amendment rights, Glendora writes. Callagy says, plaintiff's First Amendment rights have not been abridged by Cablevision. Plaintiff's claim, denominated, fifth cause of action, attempts to allege an independent abridgment of her First Amendment rights by Cablevision. Glendora says, when you take a person's program off the air because you want to cover up a bad public record, this is not abridgment of First Amendment rights? Glendora, again, this lawyer is trying to pull a fast one with Cablevision, a prime, a, a private entity, quote, unquote. There's cap, there's, uh, the caption says, again, Cablevision Systems Corporation, Charles F. Dolan, William J. Bell, Mark A. Luskarten, Francis F. Randolph, Jr., John Tata, James A. Colfall, Joseph Osnara, Thomas Garger, and William Quint. Point double C, plaintiff believes there was governmental action. Callagy says, nor are there any that suggest that any government action led to the discontinuance of her cable show. Furthermore, Cablevision is not a governmental instrumentality for purposes of the First Amendment. Glendora says the seven federal defendants Glendora kept reading the public record on were all happened to be governmental officers. Do you remember who they were? Bankruptcy Judge Robert John Hall, 
His boss, Conrad Duberstein, Judge Conrad Duberstein, uh, the United States Attorney Andrew Maloney, these are all government officers. Uh, Harold Jones, the United States Des uh, Trustee. Uh, Neil Mann, Assistant United States Trustee. Teresa Kavanaugh, Assistant United States Trustee. Joseph Derby, United States Marshal. These happen to be all governmental officers or employees. Point double D. Why does this lawyer on his page seven have to tell the judge what plaintiff's causes of action are? The judge can read the plaintiff's complaint. I don't understand that. Certainly a judge is going to read a complaint, and certainly a judge is going to know what the causes of action are. Now, point double E, negligence. This is Glendora. Now, she's quoting Callagay, Cablevision. The legal basis for plaintiff's second cause of action is unclear. If plaintiff is attempting to allege negligence, she has failed to identify any legally cognizable duty that defendants owe to her. For example, paragraph XP alleges negligence in negating the rights Glendora's ancestors offered their lives for. Okay, this allegation, Callagy uh, says, simply does not offer any legal basis for a duty on the part of a defendant. Glendora says, defendants have a duty to plaintiff not to commit these negligences against her. And there is no other proof required. They have that duty. That's sufficient. Defendants respectfully request, Callagy writes, that should the court decline to dismiss the complaint in its entirety, he's getting a little worried now, that with respect to the second cause of action, the court consider this motion a Rule 12e e motion for more definite statement. Glendora says this is not required, but plaintiff is ready, willing, and able to expatiate. Point double F, damage to reputation. As a third cause of action in my complaint, I said the cable vision damaged my reputation. Glendora said in her complaint, this precipitous, irrational, capricious, frivolous blackout of Glendora's program with no explanation, rebuttal, or discussion has damaged Glendora's reputation. One night she's on the cable TV, one week she's on, the next week she isn't. It has made her look very bad in the eyes of her viewers, of the people she has dealt with in the courts and in the county agencies. I'm talking about Nassau County, and of the people she has brought legal action against, and of the judges in these courts. That truly has damaged the reputation. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to see that, do you? Glendora says this is what plaintiff said in her complaint. It is in plain Anglo-Saxon terms. It is not the garbled meanderings of lawyer Callagy on his page 9. Callagy says, as discussed above, defamation requires a, re, uh, a false statement. The more con uh, discontinuance, the mere discontinuance of a television program simply does not constitute a statement, much less a false one. Glendora says, dead wrong. A person's program is suddenly blacked out, and this does not constitute a statement? And I point out that defamation need not be made by words alone. Defamation can be perpetrated by actions. And I make another point. A person's public access right to have her program cable cast is canceled against her will does not make a person look bad. This lawyer has no common sense. That's Callagy. Point double G, mental and emotional disturbance. This is a big point, folks. Callagy, Glendora says this lawyer doesn't know there is a federal law for mental and emotional disturbance. This is what Callagy writes. Plaintiff fails to state a claim for emotional distress. Plaintiff's claim denominated fourth cause of action purports to allege a claim for mental and emotional disturbance without physical effect. Now, Callagy says New York law allows recovery for mental disturbance in the absence of a physical impact, only if the mental injury is marked by definite physical symptoms that are capable of clear medical proof. 
Well, I think he's wrong about that. But anyhow, the point is, he's talking about New York law allows recovery from mental disturbance, and Glendora says, so does federal law. This lawyer is off the track again. So let's look at a few pages of federal law on mental or emotional disturbance without physical effect. Okay, here's one page. Mental or emotional disturbance causing bodily injury or illness is not the point, but mental or emotional disturbance without physical effect is the point. In other words, cable vision didn't come up and punch me in the nose. This is the law of fright, shock, etc. That's two pages. Now let's look at a third page. There's quite a few pages of law, federal law, on mental or emotional disturbance. Here's the third page that I include in my affirmation in opposition to Cable's Vision's effort to dismiss my complaint. And Glendora says, so here you have this lawyer wandering aimlessly into a New York law when the plaintiff is talking about federal law. Apparently, Callagy didn't know there was a federal law for mental and emotional disturbance without physical effect. Point HH, Glendora says. He's off the track again. Callagy writes, assuming that all facts alleged by plaintiff are true, it is clear that there has been no physical impact by defendant upon plaintiff that is not the issue. And he goes on and on talking about uh, physical impact. And Glendora says, and next you have this lawyer taking the wrong turn again and patting and puffing about physical impact when the issue is in the absence of physical impact. There's no claim that there was physical impact. Is this just plain dumb or is it dumb for deceit to obfuscate in the district court from the issue of freedom of speech. In other words, is he, is he just dumb or is he plain dumb so as to confuse the court? Point double I, no state law claims. Glendora says this lawyer is hopeless. She says, for reasons stated above, plaintiff's complaint of violation of Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983, this is the same uh, section over and over again, an infringement of her First and Fourteenth Amendment rights should be dismissed. Since these claims are the basis for plaintiff's federal court jurisdiction, the court should dismiss plaintiff's supplemental state law claims as well. In any event, plaintiff's state law claims should be dismissed for failure to state a cause of action for which relief can be granted. And Glendora says there are no state claims. All claims are federal claims. Okay, here's the part perhaps you've been waiting for, the recapitulation. Plaintiff repeats her complaint with all of its initial momentum straight down the road and with all of its original impact. Lindora's writing to Judge Bryant, United States Court, Southern District of New York. This is her recapitulation. What she said happened, did happen. And plaintiff speaks to the court in truth. Plaintiff was damaged to the amount of $31 million by defendants' outrageous violations of her First Amendment right to free speech. Nothing like this should happen in the United States of America. Our people did not sacrifice the only lives they had for this transgression of freedom by defendants beyond all possible bounds of decency. What defendants did is utterly intolerable in the United States of America in a free and open society. Two, plaintiff repeats her motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction to resume the cable casting of her reports of public information and public interest by Channel 24 Cablevision of Long Island, 10 p.m. Friday nights. Three, defendants be temporarily restrained and preliminarily enjoined during the pendency of this action from refusing to cable class plaintiff program, a chat with Glendora, in the form it was going for the first six programs that were cable cast on gen at channel 25, 
24. 10 p.m. Friday, to the extent that there be no more refusal by defendants to cablecast said show and said form. Four. Defendants be permanently enjoined from barring the cable casting of said show in said form and be enjoined from preventing the same of others in plaintiff's class. That's every public access producer in the United States of America. And from barring the free discussion and debate of public issues. Five, plaintiff have and recover of the defendants compensatory damages in the amount of $31 million. Six, the costs of this action be taxed against defendants. Seven, plaintiff's motion for default judgment be granted for defendant's failure to answer by January the 3rd, 1994. Defendants never answered plaintiff's motion for default judgment. They never answered the motion for default judgment. Not only did they not answer the complaint, they never answered the motion for default judgment. Plaintiff's pleading that all the aimlessness and duplicity about lawsuits outside of Judge Bryant's court be stricken from the record. That defendant's return date of February 18, 1994 be obviated and plaintiff's original return date of January 24, 1994 be the return date and the only return date. That defendant's motion to dismiss plaintiff's complaint be denied on the grounds that defendants state no meritorious defense and plaintiff believes in fact defendants have no meritorious defense and never will. Plaintiff have such other and further relief as the court may deem just and proper. White Plains, New York, January 24, 1994. The return date, Glendora, Box 416, White Plains. And the notary, the jurat, is by Francis Harrison, who is the county clerk's official notary public. This is to whom it went, all of the defendants. Some of them go to their homes and others go to the Cablevision corporate office in Westbury, New York. Now, here's a return receipt card. Charles F. Dolan, who's the owner and founder of Cablevision. Here is the affidavit of service. This was served on all of the defendants and upon Callagy on January the 24th, the return date. It was submitted uh, to uh, the court, to the judge, on January the 24th, around about 1.30 p.m. Uh, around about 1.45 p.m. and 2 p.m., I went to the uh, third floor and I uh, watch Judge Bryant. I, they have such interesting cases, folks. This is a case of a, of a man who had a tugboat, I guess, and he had an engine rebuilt, and he was trying to deliver a, a, a load of Mazzola oil to uh, someplace, I guess, in the Caribbean. And and that's what the case was about. And it was all very, very interesting. You know, you could spend your lifetime watching these cases. They're really interesting. To go to the courtroom and just listen and, and hear what people, what their problems are and what has happened. There's always a liar. And there's always one telling the truth. And a judge really has to be an expert, has to be an occupational expert on telling who is lying and who is telling the truth. And lawyers get paid for lying. Maybe that's why, uh, maybe that's why people have lawyers instead of pro se's, because pro se's aren't as good at lying as lawyers are. Now this is uh, Glendora versus Cablevision, uh, Systems Corporation and all those other people I read to you. This would be Cablevision, uh, Nassau of Long Island. Time for a joke. Pete says that he knows he's getting old when he can remember that Dr. Pe when Dr. Pepper was an intern. Bill says that his hometown has the lowest death rate of any community in the United States. That's because nobody wants to be caught dead in it. He said uh, they, uh, the fire department got a new fire truck uh, and they're going to keep the old one to answer false alarms. And he also said that the Knights of Columbus and the Masons in his hometown, it's so small that 
the Knights of Columbus and the Masons formed a coalition and they call themselves the Masonites. He says that his uh, hometown is the typical uh, small town with a post office, a gas station, a general store, and a speed trap. This is Glendora versus Cablevision Systems Corporation, uh, Nassau County, and you've got to stand up for your rights. And don't be afraid to stand up for your rights. You have them. Our people fought and died for them. So you have to keep up the fight. And you have to fight for your rights and other people's rights. You take care. Keep your courage flaming. Dora versus Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayer Pass, and the Fund for Modern Courts. What happened the week of uh, January the 17th, 1994? Uh, Judge Donovan uh, wrote Glendora a letter, and he said that he would consider recusing himself on both of my cases. Now, the other one is Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin. Uh, that's for uh, uh, emotional disturbance and uh, the 560 tortious acts uh, that they committed. So anyway, that's the one case and the before Judge Donovan. The second one is modern court. So he said that he would consider, I asked him to recuse himself on both of them. And uh, he said that he would consider it if I made a dual caption motion with double index numbers uh, and made it one motion. It didn't have to be two. And so I did that. And essentially, you've heard it all before. I don't know, maybe I should read it to you. I read it uh, on the uh, Glendora versus Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin programs. Maybe I should read it to you. Mark, the County of Westchester, uh, Glendora Plaintiff versus Daniel Walsh, Roberta Walsh, James Walsh, Nella Alpucci, Theo Alpucci, Andrew Larkin, and Kevin Larkin. And this is what he means by a dual caption motion. See the two index numbers. And Glendora, Supreme Court of the State of New York County, Westchester Glendora Plaintiff versus Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, and the Fund for Modern Courts. Notice of motion, Judge W. Dennis Donovan, present. Uh, please take notice that the plaintiff will move this court at the courthouse, 111 Grove Street, White Plains, New York, 10601, on the fourth day of February, 1994. At 9.30 a.m. of that day, or as soon thereafter, as plaintiff can be heard for an order of recusal. Dated White Plains, New York, January 25th, 1994. Yours truly, Glendora, Box 416. To all persons listed on page 2. Well, these are all of the defendants and the lawyers uh, for the Walsh case, and the defendants and the lawyers for the uh, uh, Elizabeth Hubbard case, Fund for Modern Courts. Motion for order of recusal, and this is the affidavit. Glendora being duly sworn deposes and says her reasons for moving for an order of recusal by Judge W. Dennis Donovan follow. In the Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin case, defendant Andrew Larkin is a Harrison police officer. Kevin Larkin is the son of a Harrison police officer. You live in Harrison, meaning you, Judge Donovan. Your father was chief of police in Harrison. At the same time, you were, just, you were the town justice for Harrison. Glendora does not trust your judgment. She feels you made a very bad decision on her case against Lydia Roselli Gallicano on punitive charges uh, for the defendants causing the plaintiff to pay for a defendant's con ed uh, charges when defendant had already been punished by con ed for the same. Glendora has denounced you over several pages of her appellant's brief to the appellate division and sent you a copy of the same. In approximately a year and a half, Glendora will go before the appellate division in Brooklyn or in White Plains and orally argue against your bad decision. As for modern courts, you refuse to allow Glendora to monitor your court approximately 10 times. Your law clerk, like the majority of law clerks in Westchester Supreme and County Court, was abusive to Glendora over the telephone, of which I made a written record and sent to you. Glendora also has this on audio tape and will telecast it. Glendora inst instantly protested his pushing her around. He hung up and has been hostile ever since. He was hostile before. There is no way Glendora can get a fair and unbiased hearing as the Constitution of the United States guarantees her and you, 
Judge Donovan took an oath to support both the federal and the state constitutions. Nor by such law clerks, uh, Glendorf, for one, will not be shoved around by arrogant and autocratic law clerks, nor by such court clerks and judges' secretaries. She will fight for her rights to the bitter end and stand up for the same on TV. Like you, she is Irish. Even though law clerks in the Westchester Courthouse Tower make the decisions and the judges have no say, they just sign their names and fill in the dates, Glendora will not be dominated by these law clerks. The Walsh Alpucci Larkin record is seen every Wednesday night, 8.30 to 9 p.m. on Channel 45 on the cable vision uh, in your hometown of Harrison. Glendora does not see why you make such a job out of recusal. Judge Rosado was asked to recuse himself before you on both of these actions. All it took was a telephone call to his chambers. Immediately he wrote an order of recusal and the matter was finished. Both are enclosed as exhibits. Please, let's get on with these cases before these defendants skip town. Dated White Plains, New York, January the 25th, 1994, Glendora. Okay, now here are the, uh, here's the affidavit of service. Uh, of this motion as he requested on all defendants and the lawyers and it was submitted to Judge Donovan on the 25th day of uh, January which that was Tuesday and this is Thursday and I'm reading it to you a hot legal paper this is hot off the here are the exhibits and the first one is what the first time I asked him to recuse himself and I wasn't answered. Here's more reasons. Second time I wrote and asked why he should recuse himself. One was for Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin. The other one was for Hubbard and Elizabeth Court. Uh, here is uh, Judge Rosado's order of recusal. Two pages. And here is Judge, that's what's for the uh, Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin. And here's Judge uh, Rosado's order recusal for Hubbard in the Fund for Modern Courts, Beck and Mayapath. And I believe that's... Oh yeah, and here's my letter of complaint to Judge Donovan about Mr. Santucci. Uh, I think you heard that too. Well, I'll read it to you in case. Your clerk, Mr. Santucci, was rude to Glendora. He insulted her efforts to keep the court informed by sending the court the weekly what happened logs. The court should have as much information as it can get. Said what happened logs go to the defendants and the lawyer every week. Mr. Santucci hung up on Glendora. Glendora has the whole conversation on audio tape and will discuss it on TV. Mr. Santucci should remain apart from the decision. This lawsuit has cost Glendora $250 so far. She is entitled to common courtesy. If Mr. Santucci does not want the weekly What Happened logs, then just discard them. But Mr. Santucci should not violate Glendora's First Amendment right of free speech, yours in truth, Glendora. Now, after all that, I think we should have some jokes. Charlie was talking about his hometown, and he says that uh, his hometown has the lowest death rate of any community in the United States of America because nobody wants to be caught dead there. He says that the hometown is so small that the Knights of Columbus and the uh, Masons formed a coalition and they call themselves the Masonites. He said when the fire department got a, got a new fire truck and they're going to keep the old one, they're going to use that for false alarms. And he says that it is a typical small town with a post office, a gas station, a general store, and a speed trap. You take care, folks. This is Glendora versus uh, Elizabeth Hubbard, Alan Beck, Michelle Mayapath, and the Fund for Modern Courts. And keep your courage flaming and stand up and fight for your rights. Don't let people take your rights away from you. And boy, they will. They'll walk over you every way they can. Ain't you pretty, pretty picture? Yeah, you are a pretty picture. Here. Let me move you and see to the camera. Here. Now look right up at the pupils. Say hi to the pupils. Oh, you don't like that, do you? Okay. Right.
Katie Cat. Katie Cat. This is Katie Cat. Katie Cat. No storage, all appliances. She did it as a way of convenience. There was no intent to have it under rent control. It was a mistake on her part. Gee whiz. Glendora, that's where it is. Ornberger, I do not need any advice from you. Judge, let him finish. Ornberger. Mrs. Uh, Glen Ornberger, Glendora constantly brings up the length of the appellate process to avoid paying what's rightfully due my client. She has harassed everyone and every municipal agency. Glendora, I object. Judge, it's a summation. He can say whatever he wants. Glendora, he can say those. I object. Ornberger, excuse me. Judge, you can't object. You can say whatever you want. Glendora, she has harassed the petitioner, the petitioner's family. That's wrong. It's a mistake by the court reef stenographer. Ornberger, she has harassed the petitioner and the petitioner's family. Judge, he can call you any name he wants. He can do anything he wants. And you can do the same, he says, the judge says to Glendora. You are absolutely privileged. Ornberger, and every municipal agency in White Plains, and we have an amount of paper to attest as proof of all that. We ask the court for the unpaid rent, damages to the washing machine, and the cost of this action and in accordance with the terms of Section 7 of the lease, reasonable attorney's fees. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, and what kind of attorney fees would you be seeking? Ornberger, $1,000. A son-in-law lawyer who hasn't done anything wants $1,000 and wants me to pay him $1,000. Judge, does the lease provide for attorney's fees? Mr. Ornberger, yes, it does, Section 7. Glendora, okay, it also provides for me then. And that's true. If the landlord gets attorney's fees, you as the uh, tenant get attorney's fees. Judge, no, you don't have an attorney. Glendora, my pro se fees. <laughs> Judge, the court has held you don't get those. Ornberger, section seven of the lease, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor, for your patience. Judge, thank you. All right, what do you want to say? Glendora. I'm going to say I would not have to go to all those agencies if these landlords had done their job, which was to return to me the services for which I paid. Judge, okay, that's a good summation. Glendora, and I'm tired of John Ornberger telling one falsehood after another the things he says are not true. And as far as Lydia Gallicano being exonerated for handing in a lease like that, that ought to show you the lease is no good, that she can't read a lease and that she can't put it where it belongs. And I have had no meaningful opportunity to reject that lease because I gave them my security deposit two weeks in advance of the lease, in advance of taking a possession. And in all that time, they never gave me an opportunity to read the lease. So I come in there on November 29th and they hand me a lease. I call the movers. I've given up my other place. Judge, you shouldn't complain. If the lease is bad, it's helping you. Glendora, that's what I'm complaining about. Judge, so you're complaining it's bad. Glendora, I'm saying I never had an opportunity to reject that lease. I had no meaningful opportunity to reject that lease. Judge, but now you want to rely on it. You don't want to reject that. Glendora, that's not so, Judge. Judge, you want to rely on the mistake she made. Glendora, I had no opportunity to reject that lease. Judge, okay, we are done. Ornberger. Thank you, Your Honor. Certified to be a true and accurate transcript. Jennifer Troy, official court reporter. This is Kevin Larkin and the younger Poochie Boy, and this is July the 24th, 1993, Saturday. And the time is uh, 11.45 a.m.
old oil poochie boy lives in 4B. The package came from Callagy, and uh, the, uh, at 2 p.m. the Fox paper uh, was ready to hand in. The envelopes had to be done, the printers, you go to the printers, make the masters, and then it the, has to be notarized in the county courthouse, and then the copies have to be made, and then it has to be served, and then it has to be submitted to the federal courthouse. Someday the federal courthouse and the county courthouse will be side by side in Gannett Monopoly land. Uh, the time on Broder today is three and a quarter hours. Yesterday Glendora edited Broder Chapter 59 on videotape 1400. There's been 1,400 programs, public access programs, 20 years on cable TV and 42 years on broadcast TV. Uh, now, the Fox paper was served at 4 p.m. on uh, Friday, and it was submitted to the court at 4.15 p.m. Glendora's Lincoln is shot. The garage where she took it to fix the valve lifters broke a rod and blew the head gasket. The engine that Glendora loved for 18,848 miles for 14 years is shot. These people ought to work for Gannett. Glendora had to rent a car, and because she does not believe in credit cards, it cost her $500 cash to rent the car. Callagy turns out to be the lawyer for Cablevision NASA. I want to know, did he find out Glendora had sued Cablevision NASA from the computer in the United States District Court in the White Plains building, and then did he solicit the business uh, from Cablevision as a Glendora specialist, as somebody who specializes in lawsuits brought by Glendora? It is the same dribble that he wrote for Gannett, and he contradicts himself on Form 18A, but this is nothing new. Uh, in lawyering, Robert, I don't want to go to school today. The kids don't like me. The teachers don't like me. The custodians have it in for me. His mother says, you have to go to school today. You have a lot to learn. You have a lot to contribute. Besides, you're 45 years old and the principal. The time on Broder today is a quarter of an hour. And on Sunday, this demand for jury file, uh, I should have filed that. And then I can um, have a decision made by a jury instead of by a judge. It's a very simple form. OK, here it is right here. Jury demand. Now, the time on Broder this week was 11 and a half hours. The United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Glendora Plaintiff against Gannett Company Incorporated, Gannett Suburban Newspapers, John Curley, Gary Watson, Douglas McCorkendale, Gary Sherlock, Kenneth Paulson, defendants. Plaintiff Glendora's objections to the report and recommendation of Magistrate Judge Mark D. Fox. And this is an affidavit, and here's the court filing seal. Uh, United States Magistrate Judge Honorable Mark D. Fox, United States District Judge Honorable Vincent L. Broderick. And uh, they put on the front of the paper, Glendora Esquire, Pro Se, Box 532, Scarsdale, New York, 10583. Paragraph 1, Glendora is not an Esquire. She has some pride. She is a Pro Se. By the Constitution of the United States, which you took an oath to uphold, Glendora is a Pro Se. Plaintiff has filed suit against a newspaper monopoly that has caused years of grief to herself and the other residents of Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam counties. Now, Judge Fox says, long on legally meaningless generalizations and short on specific relevant facts, the complaint purports to allege a conspiracy to restrain trade and a monopolization in violation of the federal antitrust statutes. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? That's what's going on here. Now, what is uh, legally meaningless? about the following. And then I quote all of my causes of action against Gannett and the harm that they have done us all uh, with their monopoly. Uh, and you remember that? That was in my complaint. So I don't see anything legally min meaningless about that, do you? And it goes up to count eight. And then paragraph six, although no time frame has been alleged, Fox writes, advertising rates in defendants' newspapers have risen steadily since the monopoly began, resulting in unreasonably high prices for advertising and for the product at the newsstand. Well, uh, Glendora writes that this is all true. The courts are here to protect citizens from the ravages of monopolization. And Ann Bingham, Assistant United States Attorney General in charge of antitrust, says so. And then Fox says, in addition to problems with cost, Gannett is alleged to be unfair. I'm saying that they're unfair. 
that Gannett abuses his First Amendment privileges, that it prints only one side of the story, that Gannett does not cover the news for local residents, specifically events before the town board of Harris in New York. It is refused to print some eight letters. It was eight then, it must be about 12 now, that the plaintiff, Lindor, has sent to the editor in general. It has restrained price, restrained price competition and news di uh, distribution competition in Westchester, Putnam, and Rockland counties. Lindor says this is all true, and it is just that the courts put an injunction on these Gannett defendants for inflicting the evils of monopolization on the citizens of Westchester, uh, Rockland, and Putnam. Judge uh, Fox goes on to say, it has also intimidated Judge Gannett, this is, has also intimidated judges so that an individual in Westchester County cannot obtain a fair trial against Gannett. How true. This allegation apparently refers to litigation which the plaintiff has had against Gannett in the state courts, the appeal from Judge Burroughs, Supreme Court, Westchester County, dismissal of her libel claim against Gannett is currently pending at the appellate division. Well, I think Fox, all he's doing is writing down what uh, uh, Kalagi wrote. And finally, after one year and a half, Glendora gives her a chance for an oral argument before the five judges of the appellate division, second department. She has been calendared, and if the jackhammers are not too loud in the foundations of the county courthouse tower from building your new federal courthouse, these judges may be able to hear said oral argument. In December, for the appellate division court, comes up from Brooklyn to White Plains, and we could not hear the judges and the litigants because of your jackhammers. Uh, Fox says the libel claim stemmed from Gannett's report of a suit plaintiff brought and lost against Gannett in the town court of Harrison, New York. Yes, it was a breach of contract, but uh, Judge Johnson ruled that it wasn't because Judge Johnson is intimidated by Gannett. Glendora was right in her cross motion. Defendants have no meritorious defense against their violations of the Clayton and Sherman Acts. So they try to dis, uh, distract Magistrate Judge Fox with Judge Burrell's ruling, that is, written by Charles Devlin, the law clerk, thus uh, scheming to cut a rut for Judge Fox to fall into. And they succeeded. It is not difficult to get a judge off the issue. The issue before this judge is antitrust, not libel. And Judge uh, Fox writes, the plaintiff also refers to and criticizes portions of what appears to be a Gannett annual report, which allegedly demonstrates that the newspaper business has been concentrated in the hands of a few individuals, among them the named defendants, who reap excessive profits and financial gains. No doubt about it. Glendora, yes, at the expense of the citizens of Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam counties, who are deprived of responsible newspapering. Judge Fox writes in a footnote, as best as I can determine, these lawsuits are not relevant to this case, except that without knowledge of them as a contact, some of the allegations of the complaint seem unrelated. The plaintiff's other litigation has had no bearing on my recommendation. Good. Good footnote, Glendora says. Let's move on. Judge Fox, as a result of defendants allegedly unlawful and continuing acts, plaintiff seeks treble damages amounting to $600,000 in injunctive relief as follows. Grant an injunction restraining defendants from inordinate unfairness and refusing to print letters to the editor. Grant an injunction restraining defendants from inordinate increases in newsstand prices. Grant an injunction restraining the defendants from failing to cover both sides of a story. Grant an injunction restraining defendants from superficial, sloppy, insufficient, irresponsible news gathering and news coverage. This is Gannett now. Uh, grant an injunction restraining defendants from inordinate increases in charges for classified advertising, grant an injunction restraining uh, defendants from inordinate increases in, cha in charges for display advertising, grant an injunction restraining defendants from compiling advertisers, uh, compelling advertisers to pay for coverage beyond the area they may need, grant an injunction restraining defendants from denying the public true and fair coverage of judicial proceedings so that judges criticized will have a forum for redress. Okay, he quoted that right from my complaint. Yes, this is certainly true. This is what should be done. Wow. Defendants contend that uh, Glendora's complaint fails to state a claim for which relief may be granted under the antitrust statutes. And Judge Fox says that that uh, contention of the defendants is meritorious. The plaintiff has not alleged the type of damage or injury 
are required to sustain a judgment in her favor. She has not alleged any specific damage at all. Well, to that, uh, I say this is not so. Plaintiff has alleged the type of damage and injury required to sustain a judgment in her favor. She has alleged specific damages, eight of them. But as plaintiff has said, there is no judge brave enough to rule against the only newspaper in town. The Judge Greens, remember Judge Green who made the decision against AT&T to split up AT&T as a monopoly? That was the case that was brought by T uh, MCI. But Judge Greens are few and far between, and apparently this generation gets one fair, brave, courageous, round table night, and only one. We have to wait for the next generation for a judge to do what his conscience tells him. So the judge spends four pages repeating Glendora's complaint as a filler for a decision that is a reflex, that is premeditated, that is prejudiced against the little person and in favor of the big guy, against the injured and in favor of the tortfeasor, against the poor and in favor of the rich. No, there is no gallantry in the courts, as in state supreme courts, federal district judges rule in the best interest of the judge. And this is why Gannett is so arrogant. They know judges are afraid of them, uh, this is why Gannett does not bother to answer timely a summons and complaint. They know judge will stand up. They know a judge will stand up for them. They all do what Johnson did, and what Burroughs did, and what Ingracia did, and what DePaulo did, and what Collins did. This is why Gannett writes the frothery in their legal papers, uses stationary store forms, and spouts computeries. They know that no matter what fool thing they say, it doesn't make any difference. Judges are going to rule in their favor. It's the only newspaper in town, even when it comes to sacrosanct antitrust legislation. Well, remember, judges, just remember that judges do not have the last word. Glendora does, and that is on television, and it will not be good. Well, so Judge Fox goes on to write, given a liberal construction and viewed in a light favorable to the plaintiff, the complaint fails these standards. The plaintiff states that she is a published author and a show business person personality, celebrity, who owns, I didn't state that, who owns an agency specializing in television advertising, yes, and who has appeared on television shows, yes, and who hosts her own show on cable channel, yes. No, on several cable channels. A chat with Glendora is on TV 30 time, 31 times in January, each time a half hour long, and no repeats. And just as importantly, not just on cable TV, but on broadcast TV and broadcast network TV, where the real numbers are, like 4 million viewers. Glendora was on NBC TV Coast to Coast on Christmas Eve, 1993. She was on both Concentration and Caesar's Challenge, telling three jokes sponsored by the Polaroid Corporation. There was a good decision, Polaroid versus Eastman Kodak. That was a really good one. How much money? $900 million. That Polaroid one it was close to a billion. Your report and recommendation will be read on television, just as I read all judges' decisions on TV and what my response is to the same. Glendora wants to know who wrote this report and recommendation, Judge Fox himself or a law clerk. Judge Fox says she has not identified or specified any injury that she has suffered as a result of the alleged acts of the defendants. This is not so. Glendora pointed out the injuries pellucidly. Judges being brainwashed by Caligi's lies. Judge Fox writes, she has not even alleged that she has purchased classified advertising in a relevant newspaper, or even purchased a relevant newspaper. Apparently, the judge did not read Glendora's cross motion. Glendora tells there that she bought classified advertising in the 1980s, I think $991 worth, and had to cease because of the ex uh, expense and having to pay for coverage she did not want. She has not alleged that she competes or attempted to compete in the newspaper advertising business or in the news gathering business or even in the publishing business. She's not damaged as a competitor, but as a citizen entitled to good newspapering, and as, as you are. This should have been a class action. This was made amply clear in her complaint. Judge Fox writes, she has alleged neither the status of competitor nor consumer in the relevant market, the absence of which the Supreme Court considers significant in the context of a motion to dismiss. And he cites a case. This is not so, Glendora says. How much plainer can plaintiff make it? that she is damaged as a consumer. This is a contrived and strange statement on the part of Judge Fox, and it is not true. When you have your mind preset to rule in favor of the only newspaper in town, you write embarrassing things like this. Judge Fox writes, 
Additionally, as best as can be uh, divined, divined from the complaint, the alleged conspirators are Gannett and its agents. Divine? Where is your anthropomorphism? He's saying that the alleged conspirators are Gannett and its agents. So Judge Fox says, in the and I think this is kind of flip, he says, in the context of an antitrust claim, plaintiff has accused Gannett of conspiring with itself. You see, this judge is pro-Gannett and pro-defendant. Judge Fox writes in a footnote, in light of the other Sunday papers available in Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam counties, each of which charges more than a dollar, it appears doubtful that plaintiff could amend the complaint so as to state an antitrust claim. Where is justice? Where is a fair and unbiased hearing guaranteed by the United States Constitution, writes Glendora. Writes Judge Fox, based on the foregoing, I respectfully recommend that your Honor grant the defendant's motion to dismiss. Oh, sure. The complaint and deny all of plaintiff's motions. All of them. Glendora writes, plaintiff opposes this recommendation and appeals to Judge Broderick to erase Judge Fox's recommendation and to give plaintiff a fair tribunal, unafraid of Gannett defendants. Judge Fox does not pay any attention to Glendora's motion for default judgment that defendants did not answer timely. He says nothing about that. He lets it break the rule. Glendora should have got a default motion. I mean a default judgment on that. He does not attend to this at all. Judge Fox uh, never discusses Glendora's motion for summary judgment on the grounds that the defendants have no defense. And the plaintiff believes that defendants will never have a defense. They can't defend their monopolization and their antitrust here in Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam. Yet Judge Fox lives and moves right here in Gannett Monopoly land. The handling of this matter has been superficial, preju prejudiced, and unjust. And then he writes a notice. And he tells you uh, 13 days to answer this. Well, I had mine uh, with assiduousness. I had it answered maybe in the third day. And he says, failure to time objections to this report and reclamation will preclude later appellate review. Oh, well, that's only for uh, the plaintiff, not for the defendant. The defendant can be as late as they want to, as long as they're going to act. And here's his signature. And here's a footnote of his. As an aside, nothing herein should be construed as a finding that the pleading at issue adequately pleads the other elements of a claim for unlawful restraint of train or unlawful monopoly under either the Sherman or Clayton Acts. The pleading is fatally flawed for the reason stated. Additional comment would constitute an unwarranted advisory opinion. pro -Gannett, we need a Judge Green, Glendora writes. Also, the least this pro judge could have done was to make Gannett pay the $65 for service Gannett cost Glendora by whimpering about personal service, trying to wiggle their way out of this. And Glendora writes, as far as a person can determine by the grammatically garbled federal rules about magistrate judges, it is ruled that a case goes to a magistrate judge by consent of both parties. Well, Glendora does not recall uh, consenting, and I don't think the other uh, side consented either. Glendora writes, it is too bad that Judge Fox caved in Gannett. Glendora thinks Judge Fox is good looking. Also in his favor is that he has hair. Nobody else on the benches of the district court seemed to have hair. Give Judge Fox credit that he answered fast, but then he had his mind made up before reading Glendora's arguments. Why is there all this repetitiveness in Judge Fox's report of what is uh, in Glendora's complaint? Judge Broderick can read Glendora's complaint. At least Judge Fox talks about the issue of antitrust. Glendora has waded through stacks of judges who eschew the issue. Again, Glendora is outraged that Judge Fox gave her motion short shrift. It was terrible. 